Have you ever thought where you go when you die? Have you ever wondered what's beyond this world? Do you believe in God? I got an answer for you. My name is Alona Nava. Nine years ago I had a near-death experience. I was basically dead. Some call it clinical death, others call it near-death experience. I like to call it my life after death experience. I grew up in Israel, totally far away from religion, the most secular possible. I did not believe in God, I was not spiritual at all, I lived my life how I wanted, totally wild. This experience totally changed my life. I saw my death, I saw my life till then, and I saw forward my new life that was given back to me. I saw the truth. <laughs> never in my wildest dreams thought I'll be totally orthodox. The whole way, the real thing. It always looked insane to me, but now that I saw the truth, I'm here to share it. My life changed from one end to the other. A change that only with the force of God can happen. My name is Alon Anava and uh, I was born and raised in Israel. And uh, I grew up in a non-religious family, a secular family. My whole life, religion didn't interest me. I didn't believe in God. I didn't uh, believe in any type of spirituality. I just lived my life like a secular Jew, secular Israeli. And uh, I didn't have any interest in religion. Even more than that, the religion looked to me ridiculous. And the religious people looked insane. And I didn't have any connection to religion, and I didn't want to have any connection. 
until the day that it happened. And uh, my story happened in New York about nine years ago. And it happened on a very special day. It happened on Saturday morning. And the Jewish date was Yudalid Nisan. Yudalid Nisan is the day before Passover. Passover starts at night at the 15th of Nisan. And it happened the morning of Yudalid Nisan, which is the day when the Jews left Egypt. Very symbolic to what happened. And as I said, the story happened here in New York. And I'm just going to go straight to the story because the story is long with a lot of details. And I just like giving a small introduction before I start, since the story is so far-fetched and the experience is so different, then I use terms that I find right to actually explain the story. It's almost like having a dream, and when you wake up in the morning and you remember the dream real good, but you, you can't find the words to describe the dream, but you remember every detail. Perfect. And I always use a, a, a parable that a person went on a vacation and when he comes back he tells his friend that he had an amazing vacation and he tells him, you know, what did you see? What did you experience? And he said, you know, we ate this amazing fruit and he tells him, what did it taste like? Was it sweet? Was it sour? Was it, uh, what, what, what did it taste like? And he tells him, he answers him, I can't answer you because we don't have such of a taste here. And he tells him, okay, what color was it? Was it blue? Was it red? Was it green? He's like, I can't tell you. We don't have this color here. So it's kind of the same. The experience is so from a different place that I have to find the words to describe it that it would be most close to what I remember. Uh, before I even start telling you the whole thing, there's going to be probably a lot of questions that are not answered. The story is very long with a lot of details. Uh, I will leave later on information how you can find more answers uh, to questions you have. And there's a place on the site that you can ask questions later on and uh, I will answer them. But I, would tr I will try as much as I can to be informative and just bear in mind that a lot of the details are how I find the words to explain it. Uh, like I said, it started about, it happened about nine years ago. And uh, I was in a very different stage in life where I'm now. I was completely far away from religion. And I was actually a pretty wild. And I'm sure you saw in the intro some of the pictures. And it all started in a party that uh, kind of to give you an idea and a background how it came to it is I consumed a few types of different drugs which uh, caused my heart to stop and what's called in a professional uh, term cardiac arrest and the fir at first when the whole thing started I felt extremely sick I felt there's no way to describe it but saying I felt I'm going to die and I left the party and uh, we went into a taxi and I had a, a girl with me and we were sitting in the cab driving and there's really not a way to describe how I felt but that I felt like I'm going to die and as the cab is driving and my mind is my thoughts are running in my mind and what I felt was a strong feeling of remorse a strong feeling that, that I missed something. A strong feeling that I, 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 I messed it up. I, lo I, I missed my chance. That, that There's no words to describe it, really. And besides the, physical, besides the physical feeling that I felt, there's no words to describe it. I just felt I'm going to die. I felt so sick and so bad. There's no words to describe it. But mentally, the... the, the feeling of, of disappointment, like as if I disappointed myself, like as if I didn't accomplish what I was supposed to do. And suddenly, I don't even know where it came from. I said the, the verse, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And then I remember myself falling down on the girl that was sitting next to me. And whoever knows the 
taxis in New York, they have like a partition between the back and the front. I remember seeing the whole partition going down. And this is where it starts. At first, I feel that I'm diving out of my eyes and I'm waking up in this extremely weird and different domain. And the first thing that I feel is complete silence. Silence that I never heard before. We don't notice how, how noisy everything is. Our day-to-day -day life, we don't even realize how much noise is around us. And the first thing that was so strong is the silence. There was nothing. There was no type of sound. And after that, I started feeling extremely light, like as if I'm floating. The combination of not having any sound at all and like floating, it was so peaceful. It was just amazing, amazingly peaceful. And after that, I, I noticed that the whole concept of time, there wasn't any time. I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have a watch on my hand. I didn't have any appointments. I, did, I wasn't limited in time. I was just floating there in this place of nothing, complete silence, and feeling very, very light, and, and no time. The whole time concept completely disappeared. And the feeling was amazing. It was calming. I wasn't afraid. There wasn't any fear. It was just a calm, amazing feeling. And as the time went by, there wasn't any time, but as it went by, I was like, there's no other words to really describing it, but everyone speaks with themselves. Everybody has their thoughts. And you say to yourself, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, but you say it in your thoughts. So on the same level of communication, I was like telling to myself in my thoughts, so forth, so-called, What's going on? Like, wh where am I? What's going on? This, this, you know, it's very weird. Like, it wasn't, a f it wasn't familiar. And in the same type of communication, like as if a voice is answering to me, you're dead. This is your death. And I'm like, what? What do you mean this is my death? And it's telling me, you're dead. Alon is dead. And it's kind of like pointing down for me to see something. And I, and I look down like as if I'm looking down and I see my body on the girl and I don't feel like any, like, uh, any connection so much to the, to, the, to the body. It's like as if I'm seeing something from far away. And a question that I get a lot is, what do you mean a voice was talking to you? So it wasn't a voice. It's very hard to describe it, but the same level of communication that you think with, your th with yourself, you have a thought, there's a, there's a language in your thought. If you're American, you think in English. If you're Israeli, you, say, you think in Hebrew. Same thing with dreams. In a dream, there's a type of a communication, but there's no voices in a dream. There's nobody talking to you in a dream. There's just a, some type of a very intellectual level of communication. So the same thing, that voice that I call the voice was communicating with me. And the same thing that in a dream, you, you kind of see things in a, in, a, in a way that is familiar for you, but it's a different reality. So when I was saying it was kind of like pointing down, it wasn't a hand pointing down. It was more of a knowledge telling me, look down. Anyways, I'm looking down at the body. And, and I don't feel any connection. Like I, it's like, like seeing a movie. And, and I say, this is how Alon dies? This is like, that's the end? In a cab in New York? This is like the story of Alon? And it tells me, yes, you're dead. This is how it ends. And it didn't, didn't like phase me in a negative way. It wasn't like that I was like, oh, I died. Oh, what a shame. It didn't phase me. I was like floating in this beautiful place that I didn't see anything. It was like having my eyes closed and just lying in this quiet place. And as the time went by, which again, there wasn't any time, but as the scene went by, I felt like I'm being pulled up a little bit higher and a little bit higher 
and everything s- seemed like as if I'm lying on my stomach looking down. And the whole time I'm seeing the scene of my body on the girl, in the car, and then something amazing happened. It's like as if I dived through the girl, and it's like as if I scanned her life from the day she was born to the present. And it went like a split second, but at the same time, it looked like a whole lifetime. And when I'm saying I scanned her, it's like as if I lived in her body and I saw her memories, I thought her thoughts, I felt her pain, everything that she went through from the first day she was born till that second I saw. Now it wasn't that I was like sitting and watching like 50 screens and seeing everything going on. It was going simultaneously. So I like lived her life in, in a pace of this world, but at the same time it was like a, a strike of lightning. And what was amazing is that it's like I thought her thoughts and I felt her feelings. And when it came to the present, I was thinking and understanding and going through what she's going when my body is on her. I felt how she's like getting all hyped up and how she's freaking out and how she's, she's, she's like oh, everything that was going in her mind. There's really not words to really describe the feeling, but it was literally as if I lived in her body and saw everything and felt everything. And here I kind of take a stop from the experience to, to kind of clarify uh, a concept that is very well known in Kabbalah and it br- it's brought down by Hasidic philosophy that God has many levels how he reveals himself. The essence of God is so holy that anything that will just stand in front of it will just be annulled. Kind of like if you'll take a, a man and put him in front of the sun. If you put a, a man in front of the sun, the man will melt within seconds. It's the same thing with the relations with God. If you will put any type of creation in front of God with no barriers, that thing will be completely annulled just because of the level of, of holiness. So what God does, he conceals himself. He puts layers to conceal the godly revelation. This world has the lowest revelation of godliness, the lowest level. And it corresponds to the name of God, Elohim. The numerical value of Elohim is Hateva, nature. What we see in this world is nature, that's God. That's God revealing himself to us, to the creations on this world. And the way he reveals himself is in the shape of nature. So when we see trees and water and, and, and sky and animals and anything, vegetation, everything that we see, that is God. You see God all day long. You don't realize that it's God. You don't accept that it's God because it's just God concealing himself so much that that's how we see God. And this world is basically bound by sizes. We have days, we have seconds, we have minutes, we have kilometers, miles. Everything in this world is, is, is defined in a size. Nothing is limitless in this world. Everything has a limit. If it's a second to a minute to an hour to a day to a month to a year, or if you go by the size, it's, it's one feet, two feet, a mile, two miles, a continent, but nothing is limitless. Now, one level higher of godly revelation corresponds to the word, the name of Hashem, which is Yudke Vavke, Havaya. And if you break the word to three, in Hebrew it's Haya, Hove, Yihiyeh, past, present, future. In that level of godliness, time has no, has no value. There's no value. The past, the present, and the future is one thing. It's a much higher level of godliness. It's a level that we can't understand. We can't understand the concept that there's no past and there's no f- present and the future, everything is one thing. So it's way beyond our understanding. The reason why I'm telling you all that is when I left my body, the, the, the soul was able to get a much higher level of godliness that the whole concept of time, there wasn't any concept of time. The past was at the same time of the, of the present. Like the whole concept of time just was not there. 
That's why I was like seeing her past at the same time at the, as the present. And even then happened like a, a small thing that it's like as if I saw a little bit into the future and I saw how my parents are getting like the notice that I died and, and, and I see my parents crying and I see my, my sisters crying and it's like as if I see like a little step into the future. And the whole time that this is happening, I'm still not really registering what's going on. It's like I'm enjoying the, 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 the experience. Up to that point, it was like beyond amazing. Uh, but the connection to the body, there wasn't any connection. Like it was like, okay, it was, it's like a different thing. And the experience even, the, the, the connection even to the girl, there wasn't a real connection, but it was like a channel how I'm relating to this world. And this went on, it's hard for me to define in time because it looked like a split second and at the same time it looked like years. And every detail was registered. I was able to see every detail, every, th every thought, every memory was like beyond clear. And as all this is happening, I feel that I'm, you know, being elevated and I'm going a little bit higher and a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And the more I go higher, I see more like a bigger area, like before I just saw the body on the girl. As I'm going higher, I see a little bit of the cab and I see a little bit around it. And the more the, again, there's no time, but the more the time is going by, it's like I'm getting more connected to the whole, uh, the whole domain. And what I mean by that, at some point it felt like as if I'm like in the height of like six floors, looking down. And, and then we, it, was, it, it was in Manhattan and we were driving by in Manhattan and somewhere in, along the way we hit a bridge and it's like as if I, I went through the bridge because I was like kind of like you know following the cab like a you know a magnet flying above the cab and the cab went like under a bridge and when I went through the bridge it's like as if I saw the, the illusion of this world, like the, the graphic design of this world. And the way to kind of explain it is, uh, you know, you go into a website and you look at the website, the website is beautiful, there's colors and there's text and there's videos and pictures and you, and you click this button and it takes you to another page and the whole website is, is functioning and alive and it reacts and the website looks beautiful. But if you take like the design off the website, what you'll see is a bunch of letters, like the code that actually creates the program behind the website. And a person who has no experience or no knowledge in, in, in programming, it will just look like, you know, a bunch of letters. And there's not gonna be any, that's not gonna make any sense. But when that design is on it, oh, the website looks beautiful, you see everything, everything is understandable. So it's kind of the same thing. It's like I saw like the, the design of this world, what we see. We see like buildings and colors and cars and trees, like the, the illusion of this world, that's how we see it, but as if like the illusion was removed. And I saw how the world is structured. And it's kind of funny, but there's a movie, it's called The Matrix. Uh, if you saw it, you, you will probably understand what I'm talking about. If you didn't see it, I definitely recommend to see it, at least the first part, because the other two parts are not so good. But the first part shows it extremely well. Towards the end of the movie, uh, you see the, the hero, the movie, Nero, uh, he, like, he's di he dies and then he gets up again. And you see, he sees the whole world, how it's built from letters, letters and numbers. And that's how it is. And uh, later on, I, I found out, it says very clearly in the book of Tanya, written by the, the, the altar Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, seven generations ago, a famous book called Tanya, and he explains it in depth, how the world is being created by the speech of God. In the first book of the, of the Bible, it says God spoke and he created the world, and he spoke and he created the earth, he spoke and he created the, the heavens. So in the Tanya, it explains very, very in depth and very clearly that the world is being created by the letters that God is speaking. And the letters, they create this world. 
So I was able to see like the, I call it the illusion of this world because what we see, it's not really there. It's like we, it's, it's what our eyes and mind is programmed to see, but it, in, in actual, it's not. And actually, in, in that movie I, I said, The Matrix, even though it's like a, you know, a Hollywood production and there's a lot of action and shooting and killing, the, the concept behind the movie is, is brilliant. The whole movie is based on Kabbalah, on, on Judaism. It was written by the Warshawski brothers, and they took the whole concept of, of Judaism based on Kabbalah, and they made a movie out of it. If you can take the, the, the action out of it, you, you can see the concept amazingly clear. But to really put it in, in, in simple words, is, it's like I was able to see the illusion how the world is, is created. And more than that, I said before that the, the, the world is like defined in measurements. It's like I saw how the illusion is being combined, how the limit is combined with the limitless. It's, there's, there's really no, no words to really define it. And, and uh, like I said in the beginning, I, I don't stop on too many details. Whatever's not clear, you can ask later and, and, and hopefully I can answer. But there's no other words to describe it but beyond amazing. It's like kind of seeing how the world is not how we know it. And then happened even something even more amazing. I was like literally, literally in the height of like six floors and we drove like past the building and, and at the same time I was able to see everything that's going on in the building. Every little apartment, every little room, whatever was happening there, I saw it simultaneously. Like as if I'm sitting in this big, big room and it's like I see a thousand TVs, but I'm able to understand and register everything that's going on at the same time. And it's funny, I, I, I always add that, that my wife, when I met her, she was, you know, getting closer to religion and, and she had her doubts. Uh, she was going backwards and forth. And when I told her that part, she, she, she was like, she was telling me this part, everything registered. Because up to now, I felt that, you know, the six billion people in this world, tri trillions of, of cre creatures, why would God think of me? Like, who am I to God? I'm one of billions. Why would he even care about it? Does he even know that I exist? And she said, when I heard that, I realized that if you were able to see in one building, at the same time, everything that's happening to tens, dozens, or hundreds of, of people, I understood that every little piece of creation, God knows, notices and, and has a, a personal connection with it. And it's exactly like that. Even though it happened like in, in this world's time, like a split second, it's like as if every scene had its moment, had its time. And I was able to see not only what's happening there, like as if I'm looking out of a, uh, out of a TV. I was able to understand and, and feel the feelings and, and everything was registered. When I'm saying registered, it's like as, me, as if I was looking at, a, at the person that was sitting in the room and feeling what he felt, thinking was what he thought. He, 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 if that person was sad, I felt the sadness. If the person was happy, I felt the happiness. Uh, it, it was like as if I was able to tap into everything at the same time. Now this whole part that I'm talking about, in this life, was seconds. But this whole part looked like I'm there for years. It looked like I'm there for, for not eternity, but it just looked like years. And to kind of sum it up, how it was in general, it was an amazing feeling, no pain, no fear. Uh, it was really relaxing. I didn't have any worries. I didn't have anything negative. It was just... Like as if something was embracing me and hugging me and it was like amazing, amazing feeling. Unfortunately, it didn't go on for, for long. Suddenly, without any, any warning, I felt like something is just jumping behind me and like wrapping me in like this blanket, let's say. And within a split second, I'm waking up in this completely pitch, pitch dark domain when I feel something is like grabbing me from behind and not grabbing me, like squeezing me to a point that I, I can't even move. Before that, I felt like all free and floating and, and, the, and, and at this point I felt like that thing is holding me so strong that not only that I can't move, it was like, it was painful. 
And when I'm saying pitch black, th there's no way to describe how dark it was. I always give an example like that you, you, you wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and the room is completely dark and you're like, for a few seconds, you, you, you kind of don't know what's going on where you are, but then you see a little bit of light coming from the window and maybe a little bit of light shining from the, from the alarm clock and you're, ah, oh, okay, I'm in bed and you kind of relax. The darkness was just nothing but darkness. It was black, thick black. And I know it might sound like maybe childish, but it was so scary. The darkness was beyond, beyond scary. Uh, it was just pitch black. And then I felt, up till then I felt that I'm facing down, looking down. At that point I felt like I'm kind of turned over and I'm looking up. And, and that thing was squeezing me so strong, it, 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 it felt like it's like smashing me. And everything turned, turned over. Like it was suddenly extremely scary, extremely painful. I didn't know where I am. I didn't know how I got there. I kind of like lost, let's say, memory for what happened a few seconds before that. Just I, I just woke up there. And there's no other words to really describe it, but fear that there's no, there's no way to describe this fear. And in my mind, my thought, I'm like, I knew kind of what's going on. It's like I knew it was a level of understanding that, that you just know something. I just knew that something is not good. And at this part, there's a lot of details, and I, really, I don't go into all the details, mainly because a lot of viewers I found are not so interested to hear because they're a little bit harsh. Uh, uh, like I said before, if you're interested, there's an area on the top of the blog where you can, or the top of the site where you can kind of ask questions. But basically what I felt is that that black thing, I call it the black thing because it was pitch black. Uh, you can kind of call it the angel of death. I just call it the, the black thing because that's how it felt. And beyond the, the fear and beyond the pain, it felt like, first of all, I didn't know how I got there. And more than that, I didn't know how I'm getting out of there. And I always connect it to a scenario. Imagine a person that gets sentenced to jail for 40 years. Now, you know, 40 years, <laughs> it's not fun. But the person knows that in that 40 years, he's going to have where to sleep, he's going to have what to eat, he's going to have friends, he's gonna, he can interact with the people. You know, now in jails you can study, you can do, you can do many things. He knows he's going to be somewhere, he's going to be safe. And at the end of the 40 years, he's going out. So he kind of knows what's going on, even though it's, it's not fun, but he knows what's waiting for him. Imagine, on the other hand, a soldier that gets captured by the enemy. And the first few seconds when he gets captured, he doesn't know what's going what's to happen. In his mind, he can be dead in an hour, or he can be thrown in some pit somewhere and being tortured for 10 years. He doesn't know what's waiting for him. He has no rights. He has no lawyer defending him. He has no family visits. He, he has nothing. He's captured in, with, by the enemy that wants to, to basically kill him. Kill him, torture him, do anything the, the, worst, the, the worst that you can think of. Imagine what go, what's going on in the mind of the, of the person. Magnify that a billion. I knew I was being held by the worst thing ever. I knew that I, there's no way for me to get out of there. In my mind, in my thoughts, I was like, that's it. That's my eternity. And it's not that I was stuck on a beautiful island. That thing was so scary, there's, there's no words to define how scary it was. And I always give another example. Imagine that hypothetically we would take a, a man and throw him in space. Of course, a man can survive in space, but hypothetically, let's say you throw a man in space. So he's just floating in space, knowing that a billion miles this way there's nothing, and a billion miles this way there's nothing. There's basically nothing all around him, and he can't move. He's just floating in the space. 
kind of the same idea. That's how I felt, that I'm in the middle of nothing, there's nothing around me, and I can't move, and I'm basically stuck there. And unfortunately, the, the, the feeling was just going and becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, like kind of having an anxiety that was just becoming worse, and more scary and more frightening. And the thing that was holding me, the way to, to define it in easy words, it's like I saw the devil in the shape of a human and he's basically telling me, you're mine. I own you, and you're mine, and that's it. And in, ba in different words, it's basically, you're, you're, you're out of luck, because <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I want with you. And there's really no words to define the fear. It's an endless fear. It's an endless fear of, I don't know what's waiting for me. And then started all the, the pain in it. It's not like a physical pain that you fall and, you know, there's a pain. Okay, so you take a painkiller. This is, this is not that type of a pain. It felt, first of all, that it's not holding me. It felt that, that it's ripping me. That it's basically taking pieces of me and ripping them off me. And there's no way to really describe the pain, because it's not a physical pain. A physical pain is limit. There's a limit. At some point, the pain stops. Either you faint or either you take a, a painkiller. This pain didn't f stop. It was just accelerating and echoing. And it wasn't a physical pain. More, it was more like a spiritual pain, a mental pain. There's really not words to, to really describe what's a spiritual pain. But to start with, it's a pain that doesn't stop. And it's a pain that becomes stronger and stronger. And it's, it's like a mental pain. And the more the time passes by, Everything is just getting worse and worse and worse. And it seemed like I was there, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, it seemed like I was there for eternity. It seemed like I was there for five million years. And I'm by myself there. And it was the most scariest thing I can ever, ever imagine. There's, no, there's literally no words to describe how scary it is. Knowing that nothing can get you out of there, nothing can help you. And that thing is just, it won't let go. And it was echoing Basically, you know, you're mine. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip you to pieces. That's it. And at some point, it's like as if I, I understood everything. I, I knew exactly why I'm there. I knew that I basically messed up. I did bad things. I'm, I knew this is payback time. This is the time. That's it. This is time to pay. And the more the time went by, it's like I felt like I'm being pulled through a funnel and, and, the, and, the, and, and the pulling is like as if ripping pieces off me. There's no words to really describe the, 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 the whole scene. And, and as this thing is going, it's like I feel like I'm going through like, I can't say it's feel like I'm going through a tunnel because it just was like this big empty domain. But it's like as if Flying in, you know how you, you see the movies like uh, Enterprise and Star Wars, that their a spaceship is like flying in, in space and you see like objects are just moving? It's like as if I saw objects, it wasn't objects, but it's like as if I saw my, my, my sins going through me and every time I saw one of them, there's no words to describe the, 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 the pain or the fear or the shame, or all the negative feelings that came with it. I really don't go into much details about that, because uh, it's kind of less important at this point. I, I also may have short videos more in detail explaining what does it mean I saw my sins. I don't go, I, I continue at that point because there's another point that kind of, kind of explains it even, even a little bit better. But to kind of put it in a few words, it's like, I saw every sin that I did, and it came to revenge. It came to take back what I took. And it came in a form of, of a, an extremely negative way. It was either extremely scary, and either it was extremely painful. It was basically, it looked like 
there's a concept in, in Judaism, I'm not necessarily, I'm not too sure how it's called in English. In Hebrew it's called Malachei Chabala, like destructive angels. Angels that come to destruct. And these destructive angels are like messengers that they come to do their job, to destruct. And the one who creates those destructive angels is you. You create your own destructive angels that come later on to take what they feel they own. To sum it up, there's no words to really describe the, 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 this experience. Painful to no, to no, way, no words. Scary that, and you know, I, I was never scared of anything. I'm, I'm, I was like the, the bravest kid in the block. I would jump off buildings. I would do the most scariest things. I wasn't scared of anything. This was the most scariest thing you can even, you can't even imagine. And the, just the thought, like a little kid thrown somewhere with no, nobody to help him, nobody to save him, nobody to, 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 to support him. There's no words to describe. And I knew everything. I knew how bad I was. I knew that I created this for myself. But I also knew that the only way to get out of that is God. The only thing that is beyond this devil that told me, that's it, I'm the superior here. I'm controlling right now the situation. Nothing can save you. Nothing can get you out of this. I knew that the only one that's above that is God. And I started like screaming to God, help me, get me out of here. Now, like I said before, it seemed like I was there for five million years. I'm not exaggerating. It feel, felt like I'm there for eternity. And I started screaming to God, help me, get me out of this. Like, I, I'm, you know, like little kids when they did something bad and they get in trouble. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it again. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'll, I'll be a good boy. I, I was like kind of crying to God, just get me out of here, just save me. And suddenly after like a trillion years of being there, I saw like this small dot of light, <laughs> barely saw it. It was so small, I barely saw it, but there was something. And seeing a little bit of light in this darkness, it's seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And that happened like after five trillion years. And I'm maybe saying it like in a, in a funny way, but that's how it felt. It felt like eternity. And I see this light, and I knew that if I can reach to that light, then, I'm, then I'll, I can be saved. And that light started coming closer and closer and closer and nearer and closer. And the more it came closer, it was like bright, 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 white light. And it, when it was coming closer, it was in the shape of a triangle, like a triangle that way. And it was coming closer and closer and closer. And the more it was coming closer, it was just, just covering everything. It, it was just became so big that there was nothing but that light. I always give an example. There's a movie called Independence Day. Uh, whoever didn't see it, it's not so important. But there's a part that the spaceship is coming over Earth and it's just covering Earth and all you see is the spaceship. So it's kind of to visualize what I mean. But the light became so big that it covered everything. There was nothing but that light. And that light was, at one, at, at one point it was just so bright, but on the other hand, it wasn't like bad. Like, it, you know, it's like kind of looking in the sun. You look at the sun after three se a second, you can't even look at the sun anymore because it's so bright. So I was able to look at it and it was so bright, but I was able to look at it. And I knew that behind that light, that's God. I knew that's God in front of me. I knew that if, if I can, I knew that there wasn't a chance for me to get behind the light, but I knew that this is God standing in front of me. And just having the, the presence, I don't know how to describe it. I wasn't like afraid or worried or it was just like a, like a, like an awe, like, like the biggest thing that can exist is standing in front of me. There's no wor words to really describe how I felt like I'm standing in front of this huge, 
wall of light. It was so huge, like as if you're standing and, and you look at the horizon and you can see like sometimes, you know, half of the world, or you think you see like a big wide piece of the land, it was everything was that light, everywhere. And suddenly out of this light, like as if something reached out and grabbed me, and the second it grabbed me, it wasn't like a hand coming out, but it felt like something was reaching out and making a connection. And the second it grabbed me, there's no other, there's no other words to really describe it, but the way I kind of put it in words, I felt like trillions of billions of gigabytes of information being downloaded to me. And let me make it a little bit more clear. Imagine a computer, imagine a laptop, a little piece of metal that is worth $100. It's nothing, it's a piece of metal. You just take a wire, connect the laptop to the wire, connect the wire to the wall, and within a split second, this little piece of metal that is worthless has access to all the information in the world within a split second using the internet. One press of a button, any type of search you will make, that little piece of metal, that computer, has access to get information through the internet. Any type of information. I felt like I'm this little entity being connected to the main mother source of information. I can't even say internet but the main source of information and as if endless amounts of information is being downloaded to me simultaneously. Kind of like standing underneath Niagara Falls and just the water just washing me down. Kind of like uh, taking a cup and putting it under Niagara Falls and the, just, the water just falls down. Uh, th that feeling of the information being downloaded to me was the biggest pleasure I ever felt. There's no, <laughs> there's no words to describe the, the, the type of the pleasure, but it was beyond pleasure. There's no pleasure in this world from any type of anything that is even closer to this. The pleasure was beyond words, beyond understanding. Any type of pleasure in this world is very, very limit, limited very short, an hour, half an hour, a few seconds, maybe a day. This pleasure was like eternal pleasure. And the pleasure was the information that was downloaded. It's like as if all the secrets of the universe was downloaded to me. And kind of to give another example, going back to that same movie, The Matrix, there's a part that they uh, put him to sleep and they download to him some information for about five seconds. And when he wakes up, he says, I know Kung Fu. Like within eight seconds, they downloaded the whole program and uh, 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 martial arts that it takes you 50 years to master. He knew that within a split second. It's like every type of information, all the secrets of the universe, everything was in the in the in my hands. I saw everything. I just felt everything. I, everything was just clear like as if I'm sitting on the top of the world and I see beyond this world's uh, best secrets. There's really not a lot of words to describe. I remember a lot of what I saw and I don't go into details in this movie what I saw. It's just too much. Uh, you can find answers to that on the blog. But it, I have to stress that the, the feeling was just beyond pleasure, beyond, there's no words to explain the pleasure that I, was, that I felt because of that. It says in the, in the Talmud that the souls of the righteous people who sit in heaven, in Gan Eden, they pleasure the, the glory of Hashem, of God. They don't see God necessarily. They just sit in heaven and the glory, the shine of the glory of God, they just sit and, and enjoy that. And that pleasure is understanding the wisdom of God. The understanding, the wisdom of God gives the soul of the righteous people 
Tremendous pleasure. That's what it says in the Talmud. And this is what it was. I was able to see God's wisdom and derive non normal pleasure from it. There's no words to describe that pleasure. And when I get a lot of the question, but what did you see? What do you mean you saw God's wisdom? What, what are the secrets of the universe? There's no, there's no really words to put it in. It's just, there's no words to put it in. It's just understanding something that is beyond what our mind can understand. Our mind is limit, and this is limitless. Something limited cannot understand something limit, limitless. And as this whole process of the downloading, downloading of, the, of the information, first of all, nothing, nothing stayed. I wasn't able, I didn't have the, the ability to, to, to hold it. I didn't have the ability to, 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 to sustain it. I just had, it, it just washed me. I didn't have the vessel to actually hold that information. And as it was going, as pleasure, pleasurable as it was, there was also a tremendous strong feeling of, of the opposite of pleasure, that I can't hold it, that I can't sustain it, that I can't grasp it and keep it. It says in many sources that our acts in this world creates that spiritual vessel that when our soul leaves the body, it has the tools to actually hold that godly light, to hold that godly revelation, to be able to hold that godly wisdom. I wasn't able to hold it. I was able to see it, I was able to enjoy it, but I wasn't able to, to, to hold it. So simultaneously, well, there's a tremendous feel of pleasure, and at the same time, this very strong feeling of the opposite of pleasure. I don't really know how to define it, because it wasn't, it wasn't really sorrow. It was just a feeling of that I can keep it. Almost like taking a little kid to a, to a toy store and letting him run there, and at the end of the day, tell him, okay, now we have to go home. You can't keep any of the toys. You have to leave all the toys here. Now it's time to go home. At this point, some kind of a line of communication started, and it's like as if God is telling me, why even, uh, why even calling me? Like, what are you bothering me about? Why are you even screaming for help? And from this point, it was like everything changed. I woke up in this huge domain, completely dark, and I'm standing in the middle of the domain, completely naked, of course naked in a spiritual way, not clothes, I didn't come with clothes up there, and all the souls of the Jews are standing around me as one unit, and in front of me standing a whole group of prosecutors and judges, it's like I find myself in a courtroom. And that feeling of the nakedness, first of all, the, the, the embarrassment, there's no wor words to describe the embarrassment. This is not a regular embarrassment that you slip on the street and you're embarrassed a little bit, or somebody finds out that you said something about them and you're a little bit embarrassed. This was like beyond words embarrassment. The feeling of nakedness was, it says in the Mishnah that when a person does a mitzvah in this world, when a person does a good deed, he kind of creates a garment around him. And when a person does the opposite of a good deed, he, he creates a blemish on that garment, kind of a stain. But at least he still has the garment. I didn't have any garments. I didn't have any good deeds. I didn't have any mitzvahs. I didn't have anything. I came up there completely naked. It says in the Talmud that when a soul comes up to the heavens, all the rest of the souls can read every little thing that that soul did. They see everything on the, on, in the air. That's that feeling of nakedness, like everything was opened. There was no two sides, there was just one side for it. And the feeling of the embarrassment and the shame, there's no words to it. And the embarrassment was not only in front of God, it was mainly in front of all the Jews. It's like 
I get that question a lot. What do you mean all the Jews were around you? All the souls of the Jews, exactly like the time when the Torah was giving on Mount Sinai, all the souls were there. I felt all the souls around me. And I get that question a lot, but, but I'm alive. My soul is down here. So yes, for the people who are down in this world, a little piece of their soul is down in, in this world. Most part of the soul is still up there. So all the souls were around me in, as one unit. And I'm basically being approached by the judges telling me, okay, what's your case? You know, you have here a bunch of prosecutors saying a whole bunch of things about you. What do you have to say? It says in the Mishnah that when a person creates, when a person makes, does a good deed, a mitzvah, he creates himself a defense attorney. And when a person does the opposite of a good deed, the opposite of a mitzvah, a sin, he creates himself a prosecutor. I just had prosecutors. I had a bunch of prosecutors there. Barely any, any defense attorneys. And before they even give me the chance of even talking, not that they even had a what to say, but they show me my whole life. From beginning to that point. And it's not shown on a big screen TV. It's like as if I live my life again. You know how people say, oh, I, my whole life flashed in front of my eyes. Yes, I lived my life again. Every little second of my life, I relived it. But this time it was completely different. This time I wasn't the actor in the movie. This time I was outside of the movie, seeing everything. And every little thing that I did was pointed out. Here you stole, here you told a lie, here you did this, here you did that, here you thought these bad things about that guy, here you talked bad about this person. Every little sin that I did was pointed out. There wasn't, any, a, lot of, there wasn't a lot of good things that was able to be pointed out. Maybe some other people have good things. I didn't have anything good. Maybe here and there, maybe a small good deed. It was so small, so minimum, there was barely nothing. But every little bad thing that I did was pointed out. As it was pointed out, the feeling of the shame, of the embarrassment, <laughs> there's no words to describe the embarrassment, how I felt. Because I felt like everybody around me are righteous, and I'm the big wicked man that basically messed it up for everybody. I'm the one who messed it up for everybody, for millions of souls. I'm the one. There's no words to describe the, 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 the embarrassment. And the, the, I didn't know, even know where to bury myself. It was so embarrassing. And when I say everything was pointed out, not only that I saw the actual act that they said, here you saw, I saw the the spiritual blemish that I created with that sin. To really put it in words, it's very, very hard and very long. But to kind of explain it, every act that we do, we don't realize that. Every act that we do in this world creates a spiritual blemish in higher worlds. This world is like a reflection of the world above. And everything that we do here echoes up there. So every sin that we do, we create a blemish, a spiritual blemish that the entire universe gets affected by that. And those blemishes was point, were pointed out. The fact that I stole from that person something, okay, so he suffered from it. No, everybody suffered because a spiritual blemish was created. Uh, 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 a, a void was taken from the, from the perfection of the creation. A piece was taken out. Every sin creates this huge blemish. And all these blemishes were shown to me. Anyways, I didn't have what to say. <laughs> I didn't have any, any defense. A, a regular person can maybe, you know, have an argument. Okay, maybe some of the time he wasn't so good. Some of the time it was good. In a normal case, you know, they take the good deeds, they take the bad deeds, they kind of weigh it, and, you know, they see what, 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 what weighs better, what weighs more. 
I didn't have any. I didn't have any good deeds. I have here and there maybe a few good things. I didn't have, I didn't have anything going for me. And besides the, tr the tremendous shame and embarrassment, it's like I felt like I also let down God. It's like almost like, you know, a, a young kid that his parents are going on a vacation and they tell him, we're going for two or three weeks. You have to take, you're the oldest, you have to take care of your brothers and sisters. You have to go to school, you have to make your homework, you can't have parties in the house, you can't take the car. They give him a whole list of to-dos and, and what not to do. They come back after two, three weeks from the vacation. Everything that they told him to do, he didn't do. Everything that he told him, they told him not to do, he did. They're, they're, they're so upset at him that, you know, they don't hate him. They're just so upset that they, he disappointed them. That's how I felt. I felt I was sent down to this world with a whole list of things to do and a whole list of things not to do and I messed it all up. I, I just messed everything up. So my, 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 my feelings were, you know, embarrassment in front of the whole, the whole, all the souls of the Jews, but also in front of, of God. And when I'm saying embarrassment and shame, the, the, it doesn't really emphasize the feeling. It was magnified. It was, there's no really words to, de to describe the embarrassment. It's like standing in front of thousands of people and you're the one who's guilty and everybody's looking at you like you're the worst person in the world. Anyways, I didn't have anything to say for my defense. It was just a lost case. So at that point, they kind of gave me two options. First option was going back to that black thing that brought me there. And they told me, he'll, he'll, he'll already take care of you. He'll take you where you're supposed to go which was a pretty obvious where, where it will take me. And that, then, that wasn't an option. The other option is you go back down to this world, but this time there's no other chances. This time you cannot come back and say, I didn't know, you didn't tell me, I wasn't prepared. This is your last chance. You're coming back down to this world. And at that point they showed me like my whole life forward. From that point on, till the end. And they said the first thing you need to do is you need to behave like a, like a religious Jew, like a Jew supposed to behave. The way that the Bible instructs a Jew to live, that's how you have to live. And I saw like myself with a long beard and the whole look, the, the whole thing, I saw my whole life forward. And above that, you have a, a big debt to cover. All those years that you weren't uh, behaving like how you're supposed to, you have to pay the debt. It's not just going to be erased. You have to fix all the, the blemishes that you did. That's the second thing. The third thing you also have to say to whoever you meet, what you saw, what you remember. Obviously there wasn't a... Uh, obviously there wasn't the option of thinking, okay, maybe let me think about it for one day. It was obvious which one I'm choosing. But they warned me. This time there's no, there's no second chances. You cannot come back and tell us, oh, I didn't know, you didn't tell me, I wasn't prepared. This time you know everything. And they actually literally showed me my whole life forward. Every little detail of my life was shown. Every little part. And the main thing that I remember is how I looked like a religious Jew. Like you saw the picture, how it started. For me, it was like a completely different world. And I saw the vision, how I look with a long beard and the whole life and, and everything, the whole thing. No discounts. You cannot say, I, this I want, this I don't want, I'll do this, I'm not going to do that. No discount, the whole thing. And remember, and it was echoing as, as a warning, you, last chance. You can't mess up. Next time you come up, that's it. No other chances. So obviously, you know, I didn't need a time to think about the deal. I was like, where, where am I signing? Where do I sign? I just, just get me out of here. And I'm saying it in a funny way, but it wasn't so funny. It was very scary to think that, there's the, that the other option is not coming back. The other option of going to where that thing that brought me there, that wasn't an option. That was, maybe I didn't stress it out much during the, 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 the part before, there wasn't an option of even thinking that I need to go back there. Anything that I needed to do, just not to go back there. Because I even know how worse it will get 
if, it w if I would have gotten back there. So at that point, there wasn't, there wasn't even an option. I knew I'm cho what I'm choosing. And I was like, where do I sign? Just, just tell me where, that's it. The deal, the deal is done. And I, it's like I felt like as if I'm shaking my hands, closing the deal. And, the, and all the, 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 the parts of the deal was, you know, they gave me all the conditions, all the terms and conditions. Everything. What you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. Every little detail was, was handed over. That way I can't... <laughs> There's no, there's no second chances. And the second I signed the deal, my eyes opened up in the cab. And the first thing that I do is I kind of wake up. And the girl is screaming, and the cab driver is screaming, and the whole mess in the car. And of course, I'm like completely, you know, not connected to the world. I just landed from heaven. And she's screaming, and the cab driver is screaming, and, and there's a whole mess. And, I'm, and she's screaming, you're dead, it can't be, you're dead. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I just passed out, nothing happened, I, I, you know. And the thing is that I didn't remember anything. I was like really out of it. And I don't remember, I didn't remember anything. I just remembered like something, like something very, very strange happened. And I, keep, I kept mumbling, something took me, something took me. And she was screaming, you're dead, it can't be, you're dead. You can, you can just imagine the mess that was in the cab. And, uh, but I felt something like extremely, extremely strong happened. I, I didn't know what. I didn't remember anything, not even one detail. And uh, obviously the cab was on its way to the hospital. And uh, I was like, nothing happened. You know, I passed out. Everything is okay. You know, I'm fine. I don't need to go to the hospital. You know, that was like, that's all I need now to come to hospital with, with drugs in my body. You know, it's not going to end up nice. I, I, let's just go home. Nothing happened. I'm fine. I just passed out. Everything's okay. And I felt like I need to do like something, something religious. Like I, I felt that I, I had to like make a phone call home that, I, that I'm safe. I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. And at the time I had a friend who was started becoming religious and he, Every time he saw me, he kept trying to put fill in on me. He was like, come and put fill in. And I was like, no, no, just leave me alone, leave me alone. I don't want to do it. Uh, fill in is like a religious article that men use to pray every day. So we get home at 6 in the morning. It's a Saturday. And I call him up. And I tell him, Itzik, you have to come here right now. And I have to put fill in. And he's like, what? Are you out of your mind? Like, imagine the picture how I looked, calling my friend at 6 in the morning and telling him, you need to come right now, I need to put fill in. After half a year that he's running after me to put fill in. He's like, you can't put fill in on, on, on Saturday. I'm like, D don't, don't be technical with me right now. You know, for half a year you're running after me. Just come right now, I need to put fill in. He's like, you can't put fill in on, on Saturday. You only put it on weekdays. I'm like, what are you being technical with me right now? Just, just take, take me to a, to a synagogue or something. I need to do something. He's like, are you okay? Are you, are you out of your mind? What's wrong with you? Just imagine the scenery, how I looked, and, and the, the stage in life, and me calling him and telling him, you need to take me to a synagogue. I felt like I need to do something. I didn't, know, I didn't remember nothing from what happened. So he told me, you know what? Tonight is Seder night. It's Lel Seder. It's the, the night we celebrate Passover. I told him, oh, that sounds very religious. I'll come tonight. Where, where do I have to go? He gave me the address, he told me what I need to do. I told him, perfect, I'll see you there. Anyways, the girl tells me, you were dead. I knew you were, I know you were dead. You were dead. You weren't breathing, you weren't moving, you were, you, were, you were dead. At the time, you know, a few months before that, we had a friend who died. She's like, I knew, I knew, I knew it. You're dead, it can't be. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm alive, I just passed out, nothing happened. What are you out of your mind? How can it, how can it be? And I don't remember even one detail, nothing. I, re I felt something very strong happen. Something that completely shook me. I didn't know what it was, but I was, I, it's like I came back a totally different person. For about two weeks, I was like, you know, a little bit sick and a little bit out of it. And kind of trying to figure out what, 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 what happened. And after about two weeks, I'm lying one night in bed. And I'm about to fall asleep. And suddenly, all that I just said, all the whole experience, everything comes back. 
the whole thing, every little detail, I just jump out of bed and everything, I just remember it like as if it happened that second. The first thing that I do is I wake up the girl and I tell her, tell me, did this and this ever happen to you in your past? And did this and this ever happen to you? And she looks at me and she's like, I knew it. You were dead. You were out of your body. You were dead. And it didn't, it didn't make sense. I was a normal person. Things like this don't happen. I was like, it can't be. But on the other hand, I remembered every little detail to a point. And besides that, I knew every little detail that I saw about the girl, I remembered everything. I knew details on her from when she was a kid. Every little thing that I saw, I remembered it. I still remember it so clear. I told her things that happened to her in her childhood. That there was no chance that I would be able to, to even figure out things. Names and dates and times and, and, and scenes. And, and I couldn't accept it. In my, in my right mind, I was a normal person. Things like this don't happen. Things, you know, a normal person does not go somewhere and things happen what I remember. But it, I went through it. I remembered everything. I remember it up until today like as if it was yesterday. And it was, it was very hard for me to, 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 to accept. And I didn't know what, who to tell it to. I said, if I'm going to tell it to somebody, they'll think I'm completely nuts. They'll institute me on the spot. They'll be like, you, you lost it. You're completely mad. And I said, if I tell it to the religious people, maybe I'll go to some rabbi. I thought the rabbis will think I'm nuts. I was like, I didn't, I didn't know who to tell it to. In one way, I was kind of like saying, it, it, it can't be. It, it, how can something like this be? It's not normal. In my normal mind, it cannot be. But I, on the other hand, I, I, it's like as, it just as if it, 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 it just as if it just happened. Anyways, I didn't know what to do. I decided to leave New York. I lived in New York at that time, and I decided to leave. New York and go far away to let it sit down. Very, very quickly, <laughs> the whole outer look changed. The long hair became short, all the piercings came out. And the thing is that the first change, I was a completely different person. Before the experience, I was like rough and rude and, and, and mean and anything negative that you can think of, that's how I was. And suddenly I was this nice, calm, polite, courteous, speaking soft. Before that, every second word that came out of my mouth was a curse. That suddenly I would like speak nice. Everybody was like, are you okay? You, you, something's wrong with you? And, and, I, and I was a completely different person. Anyways, I packed my bags. My friend Itzik helped me buy Tfilin and Natalis. And he gave me the basics. You know, you're not allowed to eat meat and dairy. Like, I was like, I, I don't even know how I'm starting. Where am I starting? I, I, didn't, I didn't even tell him what happened. I, didn't, I was afraid to tell it to anyone. I was like, anyone that I'm going to tell this story will completely think I lost it. So I'm just going to go far away and, and I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. So I went far away to Chicago and uh, I figured out, you know, the minimal things that I, I, I can do to suddenly change my life. So the first thing I did was I knew about it and I, I, it was easy. I stopped eating meat and dairy. You know, it's pretty easy to, to do, even though the first few months, you know, I kept ordering cheeseburgers uh, and forgetting about it. But uh, in the beginning, that was easy. Stop, you know, not eating the meat and dairy and, and not eating, you know, forbidden meat, like uh, the certain animals that we're not allowed to eat. So that was easy to stop. And I started putting tefillin, and, and that's it. And I went far away to Chicago by myself, and I was there for about a year and a half, a little bit less than a year and a half. And the whole year and a half that I was there, God was walking with me step after step after step, assuring me that every little thing is true. Everything that happened is right. I would have every night, I couldn't sleep because I had all my memories running and remembering everything. And remembering all the, you know, the, the, the bad things and remembering all the good things. And I had to let it out, but I was like, if I'm going to tell somebody, they'll think I'm completely insane. I couldn't even tell it to my family. I didn't tell it to anyone. But it was so real that I knew that 
I'm under the deal. I have to start get going. I have to get with the program. And to suddenly change your life completely when you're 27 years old, it's impossible. Well, it's not impossible, obviously. It was done. But it, for me, it looked like a mountain. How can I do it? How can I be religious? How can I not do things? How am I not going to go out on the beach and have fun with girls? And how am I not, not going to see movies? I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You know, the religion is so restricting. And I, I, I was bouncing backwards and forwards. I was like, it's impossible. I can't do it. But inside of me, I knew, I, I saw the truth. I saw the real thing. I saw everything in such a way that it was like, <laughs> not to do it, it's insane. It's like when I'm looking to dead people who are not religious, I'm like, how can they not do it? How can they not serve God? How can they not do mitzvahs? How can they not study Torah? And it was very hard. The first year and a half was, was very hard. I have some crazy and funny stories. You know, the video can be so long. I, I have it in short videos on the blog. You can check it out. But I have the funniest stories and amazing miracles that have the whole year God was walking with me holding my hand and assuring me, yes, don't worry, you're normal, everything's fine, just do it, just do it. And, uh, and, and the whole year was just so hard. Like, I'll give you one example. When, uh, when uh, you go out of the bathroom, or when you wake up in the morning, or when you touch certain things, like shoes, you have to wash your hands, but more of a spiritual ritual. You take like a certain cup, and you wash your hands three times. So I somehow picked it up and I saw in a book that it says that when you leave the bathroom you have to uh, do that spiritual wash and you, you wash your hands one time on your right hand, one time on the left hand and so forth, three times and say a certain prayer. I was like, that sounds pretty easy, I'll, I'll do that. So I started doing it. And one day my friend, the famous friend Itzi, came and visited me. And he saw that special cup, and he's like, oh, I see that you, you know, washing your hands. I told him, yeah, every time I come out of the bathroom, I wash my hands, I say the prayer, you know, I'm, I'm very religious. So he says, you know, that the Orthodox people, they sleep with such a thing next to their bed, and when they wake up in the morning, before they even put their feet down on the ground, they wash their hands. I was like, what? That's insane. Those crazy Orthodox people, I'm never going to do that. Such a little thing, it looked to me like, like completely insanity. It was just how my life was so far away from religion and every little thing was like, like a mountain. It didn't seem like, 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 it seemed, seemed like insanity. And the whole year I was just, I needed that year to, to transform from one stage of reality to transform it to a completely different stage of different, completely different reality. A reality of serving God in the way that God wants us to serve Him. So that year was full of, full of fun. I remember like I had to start keeping Shabbos. You know, a Jew is supposed to rest on, on, on the seventh day on Shabbat and there's a whole list of things that you're not allowed to do and things that you're supposed to do. It's a whole big thing. It's the biggest thing in Judaism. And I was like, how do I start keeping Shabbos? You know, there's so much to do. So I remembered many, many years before that, I had a, a relative that became religious and he told me, look, you're not allowed to light fire on Shabbos and you're not allowed to extinguish fire. So I was, I was a very heavy smoker, very, very heavy smoker. You should actually check on the blog, the movie about how I quit smoking. That's a completely amazing miracle. Uh, so he told me, you're not allowed to extinguish fire on Shabbos, on Shabbat. So when you smoke, at least don't extinguish the cigarette. So I was like, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to turn the cigarettes out and I'm going to be keeping Shabbos. And every time I would forget and turn the cigarette out, I'd be like, oh, oh, what did I do? And now that I look at it, it's, it's a joke, it's funny. But for me then, not to do one thing in regards to the Shabbos was like a mountain. Everything looked impossible. To make a long story short, the whole period of, of, of that year is extremely interesting. I have a lot of amazing stories. You can check on the blog, look for it. <laughs> Uh, but at some point it was time to, to get busy. That's it. The period, the time has come that I had to get into business. I knew that's it. I'm, I'm under a deal. It's time to, 
to do the deal. With a divine providence, I somehow found myself back in New York, which is a completely amazing story in it is, as it is. And nothing happens by chance, by divine providence. I, I met this rabbi. And amazing, amazing man. That was a tremendous big influence on me when I came to New York. And uh, I went to one of his classes, which was the first time I ever attended a class about Torah. And I was mesmerized. I was beyond amazed. So I started attending his classes. And after about a month, I felt close enough to him. And I felt that he's enough out there to accept what I have to say. He was in his classes. He, he was talking about different worlds and souls and, and all sorts of stuff and I was like wow that's you know I, I could relate to it he would teach late at night in his, in his house Kabbalah and Zohar and it, it, I was like wow I know what he's talking about I, 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 I can relate so I decided I'm gonna tell him about the story and I sat him down and I told him look something happened to me about a year and a half ago and I never I, I didn't tell it to anyone and, and I feel you're the first one I, I think you should hear it because I need to know you know what to do and I told him the whole story, from beginning to end, with all the details you didn't, that you didn't even hear. And he looks at me at the end, and he tells me, are you crazy? And I was like, he even thinks I'm crazy. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know. He's like, are you crazy? Such a miracle happened to you? And you're not telling it to anyone? And you're not doing anything about it? You are insane. You are insane. You have to go right now and, and you have to, to change your life. And from that point on, it was about three months that everything changed. I was with a long beard, the black suit, the black hat, full board in yeshiva, the whole thing, the whole nine yards. I was ready. At that point, I was ready to take the leap. I was ready to make the jump. It took a year and a half to prepare but I was ready to make the change. And very fast, I was already in yeshiva, I, was, I started to study, I started to follow everything. And in the first few months, every couple classes, the rabbi would talk or teach about a certain concept and I would be like, I, I remember that, I saw that. I remember that, I, I, knew, I know about that. I knew things, I would read things and, and explore and find out that everything that I saw is backed up by dozens of, 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 of uh, books that we have here, whether it's Hasidic philosophy or Talmud or Mishnah. And uh, everything that I saw started to come into pieces and make sense. And then it was this time to start telling it to people. And you can just imagine how, how I felt to sit in front of somebody and tell him what I just told you. So the first person I told him, you know, it didn't sound as good as this, because I, I, I try to find all the right words, how to describe it, and, and, and even up until today, I don't have the right words to really describe it. And the, and the person was amazed. And, and, and I saw good feedback, and I started, you know, started telling it to more people and more people, and then making groups. Of course, there were people who didn't accept it. People told me, you're completely out of your mind. You were dreaming, you were hallucinating, you were this, you were that. The biggest thing I ever, you know, the biggest uh, uh, objection I ever got and, and the most that I ever got is was, ah, you were, you were on the drugs, you were hallucinating. Can't happen. It didn't happen. You were on drugs, you were hallucinating, forget about it. And the thing is that what you know, when you hear something, that's, that's not so strong. When you see something, you're a believer. So what I saw and what I experienced, I can't transfer it to anyone. Nobody can convince me different. I know what I saw and I know where I was and I know what I went through. I can't convince anyone what I saw. But one thing that, that, was, that is my answer is that I knew every detail about that girl to a point that there's no, there's no way I could guess it or no way that by dating a girl for a year you can know certain details. To a point that, I, like I said, I knew every detail about her. So at that point I started talking to people and telling them, sharing the story and, and I saw the, 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 the impact, I saw the influence, how it changes people's lives, how people, people are, are, 
are thirsty to hear it. People want to hear it. People want the assurance that what they feel and what they, what they think is true. And a lot of people who don't even think that, they, they, it changes everything. So at that point on, my whole life changed completely. And within less than a year from that point, I was already married with a kid, with a very long beard, fully, <laughs> fully religious, the whole thing, the whole nine yards, the whole deal. And there's so much more details and there's so much more about it. I was trying to put the whole thing in, in, in the shortest version possible, but there's many more details. I urge you to go to the blog and, and see all the extra videos uh, that are on there. Feel free, any question you have, just use the contact form, write your question. I'll try to answer all the questions. There's a lot of details that I, 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 I didn't stop on. There's a lot of details that, that explain everything. There's a lot of things that after that, that it's just very hard to put it, put it in a short video. Uh, when I speak in public audiences, sometimes I speak for four or five hours. So I urge you to go and check out the rest of the videos and, uh, and, and feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best to answer any question. And you're always uh, welcome to invite me to private audiences or anywhere. I, I'm, I gladly go. And uh, there's, there's a lot more to it. So stay tuned. Check out the rest of the stuff because it's much more amazing than what I had to, to, to squeeze it in a, in a short video. Uh, and there's just one last thing that I always like leaving with. I'm not just telling you the story for you to have uh, uh, an idea and say, oh, great, the guy, you know, he went through what he went through. It's great. And just continue with the life like nothing happened. There's a reason why I tell you that. When I was up there and the whole, so all the souls of the Jews were around me, I saw a lot of things. I saw a lot of things that I didn't mention in the video. But one thing that I saw is what it means that all the Jews have to be united. I saw the, 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 the blemish. I saw what we're missing by not being united. And the way I see it, you can take it how, how you want, but the way I see it, and I put it in kind of a metaphor, imagine this perfect, perfect, perfect ball of light. And that light is everything. The light is the life of the universe. Everything is in that light. And we, as Jews, we're giving the privilege of protecting that light, holding that light together. That light gives the whole universe its sustenance, everything. And our job as the Jews, we were chosen to sustain, to, to keep that light, to guard it. And the way we guard it is by covering that light completely. And when one Jew does the opposite of the will of God, does a sin, it creates a hole in that, in that shell and the light starts going out. So you would say, okay, one Jew makes one hole, okay, a little bit of light goes out. But then another one does a hole and then another one does a hole and then another one doesn't keep Torah and mitzvahs and another one does a certain sin. And before we know it, instead of having a, a hole cover around the, the light that protects it, it looks like a strainer, just a bunch of holes. And all the light is just going out. So one may say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm good in what I'm doing and, and I'm a good Jew and I'm a good person and, uh, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm fine. I'm not hurting anyone. Yeah, it's good, but it's, it's not what we should do. Each one of us has his, his place in the world. Each one of us has its things that he needs to do. And every deed that we do affects the whole world. Every deed, every action that we do negative or positive, affects the entire universe. That's the power we have. We have the power to completely change and affect the universe. So I have one thing that I, 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 I like ending my, my, my experience with. I didn't come here just to, I didn't put this video just to, to share you the experience. I came to sell you something. Yes, I'm a salesperson. I came to sell you life insurance. Yes. Life insurance. You ever thought of that? I sell life insurance. But not the type of life insurance 
in this world. Life insurance for the other world. You know, a few months ago, my brother-in-law, very young man, 40 years old, went out for a run, got a heart attack and died on the spot. He left my sister widowed with three young kids orphaned. Very healthy man, never had a heart disease, nothing. Just one second and he was out. He had life insurance, a physical life insurance, but he didn't have a spiritual life insurance. He probably went up there the way I went up there, empty, naked, nothing. No mitzvahs, no good deeds, no garments protecting me, no defense attorneys protecting me, nothing. I came empty, dirty, with nothing. The reason why I was back, I can't even think of it, I don't want to think of what was the merit that decided to send me back here. Something, maybe a merit from a relative or I don't know. The fact was that I'm one of thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, that get that merit to come back and, 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 and change. Most people don't. And most people, if they don't prepare themselves in this life, they come up to the next world with, with nothing. With nothing to protect them, with nothing to be on their side. Now, there's no really words to describe it, but I can assure you, it's not an easy ride. It's not so fun to come to the end point with empty hands, with nothing in your hands. So the same thing, the same, the same way that a person in this life, he cares about his loved ones, he purchases a life insurance, a few, a few dollars a month, he says, okay, if something happens, it's an it's a insurance. If something happens, my loved ones will be taken care of. My wife, my kids. Why not to do a spiritual life insurance? Don't you care about what's going to happen about when you leave this world? When you leave this world, you're not taking nothing with you. Nothing but your good deeds. You're not taking money, you're not taking nothing. You can only take your good deeds and the, and the, and the Torah that you study. That's it. So the question is, how are you preparing yourself to get to the other side? Are you preparing yourself at all? Are you even thinking of preparing yourself? A person suddenly just dies. People don't just prepare for the day of their death. People don't just, you know, get a, a warning, hey, in two weeks you're going to die, so maybe you should uh, pack your things. There's, there's no, there's no uh, sign, you just go. So what I sell is life insurance. Spiritual life insurance, afterlife insurance. The kind of insurance that will ensure you that when you get to the other side, at least you come with something. To make a complete change from being completely not religious and jumping to the other side and becoming ultra-Orthodox, okay, you know, that's not, every, not, not for everybody. It's not the easiest thing, trust me. It's an it's a everyday battle. But something, I came with nothing. I didn't even have one good deed that I did consistently. Something small. Give charity every day, a few pennies every day. Give a smile to somebody, help somebody, do something, something small. That something small can, can, can win a, an entire universe. When you're standing in front of the, those, those judges, everything is just weight. Sometimes a small deed is worth so much. Some small deed that you do in this world can change completely how you're being judged. There's so many little things that you can just do. Just give a smile to another person. Be nicer to your wife. Be nicer to your kids. Be nicer to another person. Be honest. Work straight. There's so many little things that you don't have to go out of your way just to, just to just change something. Of course, I will encourage you to do much more than that. Much, much more. I can tell you one thing, every little thing that you do, it's worth anything. But at least something small. So I will just leave you with one thing. Whatever you do in this world echoes in eternity.
change the way of your life? What would you do? Say goodbye to all your loved ones? Pay your debts? Make sure you leave nothing open behind? How would you set the way before you leave? Would you even care what is left behind? Or should I ask, do you care what is waiting for you? Do you ever stop to think what is your life about? What am I doing here? Can I do better? Do you know what a small thing in this world can do? A small mitzvah, a good deed. Well, if you would have any idea what it does for you and the rest of the universe, you would only run after that. time for you to think what is your life about. Just living your life day after day, running after nothing, that is not what you are here for. You are here to do a change. You are here to serve God. You are here on a mission. It says in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, in the second chapter, V'al tomar lech she'efne eshne, shema lo tifne. Don't say, I will do it when I get there, because you might not get there. It says in Tanya, היום לעשותם. Today is the time to do it. Not tomorrow. Today. Today you can do the change. Now I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying to go crazy. But something. One small deed can make a huge difference. 